Thank you for joining us today. This is We've Got Issues, and I'm Brad Nickerson. We've Got Issues is a nonpartisan, citizen-based forum where we look at issues of interest to the Tri-Cities. First, I'd like to thank Tri-City Community TV for making this program possible. Before we get started with today's interview, I'd also like to acknowledge that this program is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coquitlam First Nations. We thank the Coquitlam people who continue to take care of these lands and all that is above and below. Today, we're talking to Councillor Daryl Penner, who has served on the Port Coquitlam Council for a number of terms now and is seeking re-election. Daryl Penner, thank you for being here. And thanks for inviting me. Oh, you're more than welcome. Um, so you have been a, uh, a councillor for a number of years now. Yes, 23 years. Got elected in 1999. Okay. Yeah. And how's that been for you? It's it's been really good. Uh, well, like anything that happens in life, there's you know there's ups and downs, but uh, uh, certainly overall it's been uh, it's been very enjoyable, very rewarding. Uh, I feel uh, quite grateful to have been a part of this community and being able to help make decisions that move this community on. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite thankful for that. So that, that would mean that you, you've been um, a councillor through a number of mayors? Yes. Yeah, yeah Mayor Trabulay was, uh, uh, I first uh, got elected and, uh, and it was interesting. Um, Len, I knew Len when, he, when I was a young boy. Uh, so I've known him, knew him for a long time, and uh, and then there was, uh, I believe, Scott Young, and then uh, Greg Moore, and uh, now uh, Mayor Brad West. Well, you've done this for a long time. Why? Do, do you mind if I ask? Has it never been attractive to you to be the mayor? Um, there were times I, to be, you know. My first term after uh, being on council, I I thought that I. I should run for mayor. Um, that would have been running against uh, Mayor Trabule, who did a great job for the community. And uh, but you know everything needs changes at times. And uh, but very unfortunately, excellent gentleman uh, passed away uh, within a couple of years of uh, on the first term. So okay. So um, in that span of time that you've been a councillor, you you must have seen a, uh, a huge change in our community. Oh, I've, I've, well, not only on council, just my, uh, you know, 50 some years in this community. I mean, uh, walking down uh, Prairie between Coast Green and, and uh, Cedar Drive on a Saturday afternoon down the middle of the road with no traffic, thinking about how many people are going to live here. There was the, uh, the, the ditches on the north side had salmon in them. Uh, you know, that's how things changed and uh, clearly lots of people decided to move here. But I just remember that particular day, uh, it was in August and, uh, and, and that's always kind of uh, been something I thought about, you know, how the community has changed. Has changed over that period of time. So um, it, I'm, I'm going to challenge you even a little bit more to, to, to tell us more about what that change looks like. What does it look like? What are the, the big things that you see? Aside from, obviously, there's been a growth in people, but what other kind of changes are you noticing? Well, uh, certainly uh, homeless issues. Okay. Um, we've had, um, you know, the uh, you know, children that are going to school that are hungry. Uh, when I was in school, I just did not notice that we had, I, we had one fella. His name was Charlie, mm -hmm. and he was down. He lived down downtown Poco by the river, and he was really our only visible homeless person. And every once in a while, he would uh, go and get cleaned up, and then he would show back up again. Mm -hmm. And then things changed substantially um, when uh, you know, as when Riverview got closed down. That was, uh, in my opinion, an absolute disaster. Uh, the funding didn't come with what that support needed for those people. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that was the big change uh, for our homeless population, uh, which is really unfortunate. Because we're a natural, we're a natural place for um, people to end up, given our proximity to Riverview. I would imagine. Yeah, and and you know when Riverview was uh, open, 
We had, there was really no issues with, with, with any of the clients that were there. Uh, they mm -hmm. would come into downtown Poco. It, you know, Poco was much smaller, it was a real little town at that point, mm -hmm. but there was really never any issues. It was, it, it just worked. The community um, not only, you know, embraced them, uh, we had a lot of the people that lived in our community worked there. Mm -hmm. So it was very integrated that okay. way. All right, so uh, so it was an industry in a sense for our community. Um, so while you saw those changes, what did, if you don't mind me asking, what did that look like on council? What were the conversations about that on council? Well, I mean, always compassion for them, F total frustration with um, with the province and the federal government, because the reality is is that um, municipal governments don't collect taxes to deal with those kind of social issues. Right. Um, but by default, we end up having to deal with them because it affects the, our residents when mm -hmm. we have, uh, have people um, that are homeless and, that, and some of them are real problem people. They have uh, mental health issues and addiction issues. And, uh, and that needs to be dealt with you know, through the health authority mm -hmm. uh, and the province. So not, uh, not seeing the, really the level of help that's needed uh, from the provincial and federal government, we again, I said that we're by default we end up stuck with having to deal with some of these problems. So mm -hmm. uh, that that is, it's a very unfortunate, uh, right? And thing. that's something that's gone passed passed along over the years. And as you said, right. we've seen it growing. So that's something that we're going to have to deal with. What um, can I ask again? Um, because I'm not trying to put you on the spot, um, well, but what can a council do to advocate w to the to the higher authorities in a sense, the the provincial government and the federal government? What can councils do to um, to change that situation? Well, uh, I mean, we we uh, have constant dialogue with our uh, MLA and um, and our MP, uh, and that's kind of the avenue, you know, that you. Really, that's kind of our avenue that, uh, uh, and uh, be advocates, of course, for them. Mm -hmm. um, so part of that landscape uh, is also uh, having um, affordable housing, non-market housing. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we can do. I know the last election, there was a lot of people that wanted to see that happen. It was, a, and housing, of course, is a huge issue, uh, well, in the whole country, but particularly Vancouver is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the most expensive cities to live in. So one of the things that we, we have done and we think we've done very effectively is create a lot of non-market housing that's not subsidized by the taxpayer. So again, back to the idea that, um, you know, it's really a federal and provincial government's uh, role to deal with but as a community, how can you create more affordable housing? And so we've done that through nonprofits um, and with uh, housing density bonuses and so forth. And so we've been creating quite a few units. There's, um, I think we've got about 800 and some units coming on online. So is, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if we're jumping a little bit ahead. Um, is, that, is, is that something that you're doing right now, or is that something that's been go you've been working on We're, since you became a counselor? It, it's initially? it's been ongoing. It's been particularly ongoing. well. I mean, 23 years ago, no, we weren't we weren't dealing with that. Right. Uh, it's really been probably the last 12 years that that's been something that uh, council has been you know working on. Uh, mm -hmm. We came up with the housing density bonus. So basically, what that is is that a developer wants to increase the density of a particular spot. Uh, area so that FAR, uh, they would pay a certain amount of dollars per square foot, that money. FAR? Florida area ratio. Okay. And so that one, that money then goes into a fund to help uh, build um, non-market housing. Right. Okay. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to pause a little bit right here and go back a little bit and ask you directly. Sure. So in your, uh, and then we're going to, then we'll move on to more of what, um, what count the council in your last term has done. But in your early, in, in the earliest years up until this last term, um, what, I'd like to know basically two things. What was your focus in those years? 
And um, do you feel like you've accomp you accomplished those things while you were doing those? Because I'm, interest I'm interested in that part. Like, it's mm -hmm. not often, we haven't really talked to somebody who's been there th as long as you. Uh, and so, and I think that's really interesting, um, the process and, and understanding what a, what a counselor sets out to do and what they actually can accomplish in that time. So if you don't mind, sure. it, it, I'd like to know about those earlier years that you, sure. you've done this. So when I first um, was elected in 99, right. um, the first thing was to frankly get my head screwed on straight, mm -hmm. figuring out how this whole machine works. Right. Uh, it's been very interesting talking to people that, you know, uh, doesn't matter what their age or their background, if they haven't been involved in that, it's a it's a different it's a different beast. Yeah. You have to get a try to get a really good understanding on how it all works. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing that I, I had to do. Mm -hmm. But my goal going into it was to have uh, better development. Uh, my my underlying reason for uh, getting onto council is there was a development that took place on the north side uh, that came very close to Hyde Creek. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was absolutely ridiculous that we would be pushing houses right up to the edge of Hyde Creek mm -hmm. uh, when it's a greenfield development, meaning there was nothing there before. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ensure that that was, you know, we would change that mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and then develop policies that would, that would limit those kind of things. And in concert with that, you had the, um, the Fisheries Act and, and so forth. So, mm -hmm. so those, all those things kind of changed uh, since I was on council. Okay. I uh, wanted to have a, a city hall that was much more receptive to people coming in with I new ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't like that when I first got elected. I, I thought that was, you know, this is, this is a city hall is a building for all of us. Mm -hmm. And it's a place that people should feel comfortable. And if they have ideas and they want to do something that they should be able to ex at least express them, uh, with uh, and, and not feel bad about uh, you know being criticized about it. Mm -hmm. So that was that was kind of the underlying thing that I really wanted to see happen. When you say they shouldn't feel bad about criticized, do you mean that they shouldn't they shouldn't go away feeling like they were criticized? Yes. Yeah. 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 That maybe that's better. <laughs> yeah. Better, yeah. Better, better just, sorry. Just clear that up a yes. little bit. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. And so. Um, Making City Hall more um, uh, uh, more accessible to regular people. That's what right. I think I heard you say. You know, I mean, the, the catchphrase is transparent, you know, tran you know, transparent government. Right. Sure, right. you can say that, but I think it's. Uh, I mean, if you have good uh, dialogue you, with uh, with the city, you you have a better understanding of how it works, and that's right. usually most people because you know, like I was saying earlier. People that get elected are trying to figure out how it works. So, well, if you're not in it, and a person just shows up, how would you expect them to know how the how it works? So, yeah. if if the, if it's clear enough, uh, and the person that wants to take the time to learn, then it it hopefully um, helps them navigate through right. the city. Do you uh, so over the years? Do you think you've been successful with that? Is that like I, that, that, that? I I yes, I I think very successful. Okay. And it's not so. It's not always, it's not just one person. I mean, you could be an advocate um, and, and, and that's, you know, that's the best that you can do. You have seven people. And so it's going, it's at the worst case, it's four people that decide. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, ideally the, the process that is that you have, generally you have most, most councils, most of council is in agreement. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be, I think the, you know, the best indication that the policy or whatever you're working on is, uh, is successful. Right. So, and tell me with regards to exactly that, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, a, a motion is put forward to the council and it's something that you're considering and there's a really robust discussion about it. Mm -hmm. And after that robust discussion, they come to some, hopefully, they come yeah. to terms where everyone gets something out of the process and agrees on whatever that was, it, what it should look like. Right. Right. And the robust discussion is one thing, but it's the be respectful. Uh, we see this, you know, now it, 
this has come you know much uh, far more forward uh, in the uh, now that you know to be a, have a respectful workplace and so forth it, um, and our council uh, since I've been on it uh, really we have prided ourselves in trying to be respectful have mm -hmm. debate I mean mm -hmm. we've the years I've been on council we've had some real real arguments okay but when it when they when the discussion is over it's over you make your you do the vote and, and and that's it and it makes it much better for the next time when you're going to bring something forward right that the baggage isn't there right because there's no reason there's no way you should ever vote against something because somebody else voted against what you did or right. what you put forward right it's a very it's it's you're not focused in on what is in the best interest of the community right it's not a tit for tat it, no it's, it's more of a it sh it should never be that way right right all right so okay so um i'm going to just ask one more time um anything else uh that you rem you remember from when you began to become when you first became a counselor to that you you set out to do and and if there's if you want we'll just move on to um this l most recent term sure um, well, one of the things that, that I was involved with in my very early years and continue on uh, has been developing trails. Mm -hmm. uh, trail system in Poco, I, growing up, you know, we use those trails uh, like our own roads. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it certainly is something that people really enjoy. It's a piece of infrastructure that almost every person can use. Mm -hmm. not, you know, not everyone, but the vast majority. Uh, and so one of the things was to develop uh, better trail systems and put more money into the trail mm -hmm. systems. And uh, I, I was, I, I worked hard. I, I actually took staff out, uh, called it Thule tromping, mm -hmm. took them through the bush and saying, here's, here's some of the little trails. They're not um, really defined, but this would take you, you know, like up to Chelsea Park and the, that whole area. And, uh, you know, and here's how we can have these integrated uh, continuous uh, loops mm -hmm. uh, of trails um, and so I, that's something that I've always been a champion of and mm -hmm. and will continue to be. As someone who uses the Poco Trail almost every day I appreciate it. So it thank was, you. Yeah I mean when it was started uh, you know I'm sure the people um, the, the, that had started it did not understand or would not have understood how great of an asset that trail is. Absolutely. Uh, it, it, it is Although it's a bit of a secret, I think, in the Lower Mainland, it is truly a, a gem of a trail. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Not many communities have that. All right. So let's, let's move forward to um, the la last term. We'll just quickly go in that term. Um, and I, I, I want to ask you, uh, what, was your, what were the things that you were trying to achieve in the last, this last um, four-year period? Well... <clears throat> We had one of the things that was a big interrupter was COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so that I'll, I'll put a placeholder in that for now. Mm -hmm. uh, so the previous election, mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, we had put in a um, uh, it was a levy for the community center. Okay, and that was an incredibly clear indication from the community on the support of that. They wanted to see that, that uh, facility built. Mm -hmm. So that was actually one of the biggest um, con um, uh, focuses of, uh, I mean, not only myself, of course, but all of council. It was, you know, all the council fully understood that mm -hmm. and we needed it as a community. Mm -hmm. Then making sure that we're not going to be taxed to death on it. And how do we, so, so we, we spend, I think our council spends a tremendous amount of time focusing on, on finance, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I will put the plug in, we're the third lowest uh, tax community in all of Metro Vancouver. And that's mm -hmm. not us saying that, that is Metro Vancouver saying mm -hmm. that. And we managed, to, we managed to get that community center built during COVID, uh, on time and on budget. Okay. And I would challenge you to try to find how many government organizations can say we did this on time and on budget. Sure. And that was during COVID. 
-hmm. and you had a lot of uh, blood price increases and stuff. I mean, timing is, of course, a, a lot as everything on a lot of things. But you know, the fact that we had uh, gotten our contracts in place and we spent a tremendous amount of time going through those budgets all all the time, mm -hmm. and and our, of course, uh, staff uh, were paramount in, in dealing with that. Mm -hmm. They did a great job. Sure. Um, it, uh, anything else that that was a priority at that time? Uh, well, certainly, you know, back to uh, when we 12 years ago or so, when we really started focusing on non-market housing, that was a that was a big thing. The last election, again, people commented on that. So we we worked very hard at working, uh, sorry, uh, at getting more non-market housing units online mm -hmm. uh, that were not subsidized by the taxpayers. Sure. And so we managed to get a lot of that. Okay. That's going to go on too, isn't it? Absolutely. For, what, what, um, what do you think, the because I, I don't know the answer to this, um, so I'm very curious. What is well, the time? Well, I hope I do. Pardon me? <laughs> I hope I do, whatever yeah, your question well, is. Well, I think that you might have a little bit more of an insight. Um, you might have heard more. What is the, um, the timeline for what they think the influx of people in our community is going to be? Like, I, I know years ago I heard about all the communities in the lower mainland needed to brace themselves for an influx of, of people moving to the lower mainland. And we're still feeling that. But right. what is the period of time we think that that's going to go on? And that's, that, I know that that's a tough question because... Um, it's gonna, I, it, it doesn't matter what. The, the projections are, what I can see, they're projections to a certain period. Right. Uh, what's going to happen, you know, in, in 20, well, 2030, I think, is what the projection period is. And, and it's at, um, I think, the projection at that time. And this was a projection by Metro Vancouver right. or uh, GVRD at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it was around 80,000. 80,000. Yeah. So we're, I, I think, around 61, 62,000 right. Uh, right now. Right. Um, but then moving forward, yeah. uh, we have uh, Metro Vancouver, we have somewhere around 1,200 people coming in a month, mm -hmm. and we only have about 500, 600 starts. Yeah. So that by itself is, is fundamentally the problem. Right. So, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, like, a, this is, um, I, I hope it's fair, um, and it's, the question is speculation. Well, I'm going to okay. ask you to speculate here a little bit. I don't usually like to speculate. Okay. Well, uh, then just let's like, make it an opinion, and it's just you and me, and we're not in front okay. of a camera or anything like that. Um, <laughs> like these ones? Like the ones that are, yeah, <laughs> okay. right here. Um, no, so... What, what, how do you think we're going to handle this problem? Because if the projections just go to um, 2030, it's still, there's still going to be pressure. What, what, do you what do you wish for future councils? Now, the projecting, what do you wish, how should future councils approach this and what should they be doing? Should we continue to tr spread out like we've seen on Burke Mountain? Or sh at one point, are we going to have to make a choice to go up? Well, we're already making that choice to go up. To go up. We are... Um I mean, our choice is to densify. Yeah. Densified, like, towers yeah. are actually a far more environmentally friendly footprint than, than spreading out. Uh, I'm absolutely uh, opposed to um, urban spread, urban mm -hmm. sprawl. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, it, infrastructure, you build more and more infrastructure, people drive more and more, all those things. So, And that's costly to people, isn't it? When, co very when, much when so. You, when you build two miles from a city core, you have to build all that infrastructure right. out there. And who, who, who pays for that infrastructure? Well, I mean, it's uh, developers pay for it. Taxpayers pay for it. Everyone pays for it at the end of the day. Right. Um, but, but it's costly. It's costly. The council of any city has the ability to, to say, yes, we'll densify here and we're not going to densify here. Yeah. So th that's really, you know, it's really in the hands of, uh, of, of every government. Mm -hmm. Just because the projection says that's what we're doing doesn't say that we're bound by any kind of legal Right. Legal uh, document saying you have to densify. Yeah. You, you know, there's lots of advantages to densification because uh, when you have a uh, high density area, you businesses that then can open up uh, and people that live in the area can support those ones. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 
buying their groceries, buying uh, whatever they need, mm -hmm. they don't have to drive. Right. And that's why, you know, densifying and going up, uh, why that is uh, much, it's a much better approach. Right. If you believe that you should have more people right. coming into your community. So you, you would probably have your ear to the community better. Do, pe or do people in Port Coquitlam support that? I think they support it in places that make sense. Okay. Uh, and I think that's, so that's, that's, the, that's the key part there yeah. uh, that, that makes sense to the community. Uh, so when you're developing your official community plan, mm -hmm. that you look at areas that uh, have the best access to um, public transit, yeah. So that the people that live there can ideally walk there. Mm -hmm. um, the public transit is kind of out of our hands to a great degree, but but that's uh, that's part of the metro. Um, <coughs> excuse me, metro plan for the transit, the TransLink plan. So, so that's where you want to focus in on those uh, those developments mm -hmm. um, because you will have, uh, and we've seen in other areas uh, in Poco where you have single family homes. Excuse me for a minute. Um, that um, uh, you know that will then get taken down, and then you densify those areas. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, usually the comments that we get from people on densification as well. There's going to be more traffic. The, definitely, there will be to a degree. So the 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 the, the um, uh, I guess the conundrum that you're in is that do you densify, which does create more <clears throat> um, more traffic, or do you do you not densify and then spread out, which is which which would create even more traffic? Yeah, uh, because of all the roads and and th there's a saying that build it and they will come. You build a road. You can never build your uh, history has shown throughout other major cities is that you can't build yourself at the end of the day out of traffic jams. Mm -hmm. The more roads you build, I mean, you look at what happened. Uh, Highway one. Mm -hmm. Right, east and west, out in Abbotsford, all of a sudden, all these people moved out to Abbotsford. They buy acreage and all that, and then, and now they're all driving in, and it's just a parking lot. Right, and on top of that, it becomes attractive to developers to develop farther out. Yeah, and create those those yeah. farther out developments. Right, right. Okay, so um, I'm using up all the time talking about other things, uh, and and what's really the most important thing here, and we have now the littlest time for, Not is this next new run. Uh, you're gonna you're you're running for. Uh, the same seat, um, not running for mayor, I think we've established. Yes. Uh, we're running for the same seat in this next election. What do you want to accomplish in that? Um, well, uh, it might not sound so uh, sexy to say the same thing I've been working on. Mm -hmm. um, th uh, living in the community as long as I have, I think I got a pretty good pulse of what, what we want. Sure. And uh, the continuation of making sure we develop our trails, mm -hmm. making sure that we uh, have uh, good non-market housing, and then we have lots of different forms of housing because uh, you don't want to have just one type of housing. So, uh, at, at, and I'll, you know, having mixed use uh, buildings where you have commercial and you got residential, I think mm -hmm. those are very important to, mm -hmm. uh, to bring forward. Um, and keeping an eye on the on our taxes, mm -hmm. uh, but not only keeping an eye on the taxes, but ensure that we have good quality services. That that is, it's it's frankly super easy to cut taxes, but then it's like if you're cutting taxes, what are you going to? What's coming off? Uh, what are you not going to do? Mm -hmm. And. Usually you get the complaints that, well, this used to be here and now I can't yeah. do this. Or that's, that's a, see, like you put your finger on what is for me a huge, huge issue is I think that a lot of times people don't understand the relationship between taxes and the services, the government services. Right. In this case, we're talking municipally, the municipal services that you get. If we cut those taxes, if we, if we focus on a low tax um, approach all the time, it means it's going to limit what the uh, the quality of life is Absolutely. if we're not careful. And that's that balance. Right. You know, um, I mean, I, I want to live in a community that has high quality services, mm -hmm. uh, that looks nice, mm -hmm. it's well care taken care of. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, as soon as, and you've seen this in lots of cities, as soon as you have areas that are not well taken care of, you know, houses are 
uh, dilapidated, or you have uh, commercial areas that are boarded up, and then mm -hmm. you know, and then crime comes in. I mean, you have you know graffiti. I mean, we have graffiti yeah. now, but but that urban blight just seems to you know keep moving. It can spread. It spreads. So uh, it's really important that you that you keep that in mind all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we should we should be glad to live in our city. We should be proud to live in this city. Uh, and as other communities, they should be also proud. So uh, creating, that, creating that environment is kind of the most important thing mm -hmm. overall. Mm -hmm. I'm, um, I'm thinking this, is, this has been a really, um, a, a, a very interesting conversation. Was, it's, it's a short period of time and there are 22,000 other things that I'd like to discuss with you with regards to that. But um, I don't want to be remiss in talking, uh, to, in putting, um, talking about one of the passions that I have um, uh, and, and my friends in the community would be, would be upset with me if I didn't bring it up. Okay. I want to talk to you about art in our community. Yep. Um, how, wh where do you see, do you see that there's a place for that? And is there any plans in the future of um, expanding the, the, the opportunities for young people in the arts? Well, um, I know that's tough because uh, no, no, it's it's fair. It's 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 really interesting um, that we the surveys that we've had mm -hmm. when 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 the public is asked about arts, mm -hmm. and this is not my opinion. This is just a survey sure. no, it's that the arts actually come quite low, mm -hmm. except for when people when they talk about other places in the world on how wonderful they are. And then you go to Europe and everything. Mm -hmm. Their arts culture is so rich. And they talk about that. So there seems to be a disconnect between the average person and, and, and arts. Mm -hmm. But the average person always, always loves the arts. So uh, when, they, when they, they appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So uh, going back to having a city that is a great place to live. Mm -hmm. Well, the arts is, is really important to have. Uh, and it's a balance again with, you know, with budgets. Uh, we've had, we, we built Lee Square. Sure. I mean, that was a, uh, a, to be an arts village. There's been some changes that's happened. Uh, we certainly have supported the arts quite, quite a bit. And the arts community, it's a, it's, it, that needs to also work together and then come to the city and say, you know, here is what all, if you could collectively have all of the arts groups in one group and agree on stuff, this is where we want to move forward. Right. We did that with uh, sports. with sports, yeah, and it worked has worked out extremely well. We would love to see that happen. Have a really cohesive arts council mm -hmm. uh, that we can we can have that conversation with. Uh, if I'm reelected in yeah, the next yeah, term, yeah. Uh, that would be uh, that would be give us really clear directions. We mm -hmm. the the council has never had a problem supporting the arts. I mean, it's pretty obvious what we've done to date. Okay. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, I, I, I like, you know, I mean, as you know, I, I play music. I think music is just paramount, to, you know, certainly in my life. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think for most people. So I did not know that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now you've just graded, okay. we've gone from 22 to 26,000 questions. Um, and what you said about the arts, the, you've really provided a fabulous answer, and I really appreciate that. Those people, if they hear it, it sort of prescribes what they should be doing. So thank you for that. Um, I, but you encouraged me to ask the final question, which is with regards to reaching out to people, um, because I think um, people reaching out to you, is, is the, are people... Are, are you accessible to people and and is that a realistic way that people should contact and make sure that they've they've talked to people like you about what they want for the city of course I mean that's what we are is a you know count your council uh, and you know as myself uh, we represent the community and it's always uh, always interested always wanted to know uh, if there's something that's really missing what what is it and and how can that be changed um, you know, and nothing to do with arts, but you know, just one person coming in and saying this is what I want to see happen mm -hmm. uh, is not a real, true test of what needs mm -hmm. to be done. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important that um, you know that people do talk to council not only about the arts but about any any anything, issue, Absolutely. any issue, uh, uh, and ideally not at an election time. Yes, because. Yeah. There's four years behind, you know, yeah. and, and so the next term, you know, talk to your talk to the council all the time. So council is accessible to individuals, but it's better 
if you come as a group with issues so that they, the council sees that there's backing behind it? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and that's what our council's for. Yes. Daryl, this has been fabulous speaking to you. I'm, I really appreciate you coming in and talking to us, and thank you for taking the time with us. Well, thank you very much uh, uh, for having me. I appreciate it, appreciate all the work that you uh, folks are doing. Great, thank you very much. This has been We've Got Issues. We've been talking with uh, Councillor Daryl Penner, who is running for election in this the campaign that's October 15th. Uh, 16th, I believe. 16th. The election is on October 16th. Please make sure that you come out and vote. Um, thank you to Tri-City Community TV for having us and hosting us here today. Thank you.